Hello, Master Brokers, and welcome to our first event of 2024. It is so wonderful to see everyone here tonight. Um, if you could now please silence your phones before we start it. And also, if you have not validated your tickets, um, Maria's right there. She can validate your tickets whenever it's convenient for you all. And I want you to join me in welcoming some of our new members. And some of them are here tonight. Um, as I call your names, please stand up to be recognized. And the first one on my list is Christina Formosa. Stand up, Christina. Elizabeth Freire, I don't think she's here. Ishmael Perez. Gina Rojas. And Blair Sunville. <laughs> to all of you, welcome to the Master Brokers Forum. So we have a very packed program tonight. Um, you will be entertained and enlightened by the brilliant minds from City National Bank. And Anna, of course, please applause. Um, so, but I have to apologize uh, on the outset for beginning, we're beginning with a sad note. Many of you know that we lost a very beloved member and longtime board member. Um, she was a board member of the Master Brokers Firm until 2011. And I wanted to take a moment to honor and recognize Joanne Foster, and I'll try to not cry. Um, her many contributions to our chapter um, during her critical time on the advisory board. She, uh, she blessed us with her brilliance uh, with marketing, her vision. She was a marketing genius and she demonstrated that with her own website and she was ahead of her time all the time. She was a dynamo. And um, under her leadership, we, we established and refreshed our brand through updated logos, design, and websites. As a top producer in the market, Joanne was an example who, others, who other people love to follow. She helped us grow our membership with the most qualified, seasoned, and respected professionals. Joanne was a very special person. She was an icon in... <laughs> I didn't think that was gonna happen to me. An icon in, an industry, in our industry, a great friend and a loving person. She will be missed by all of us who were touched by her magic. We love you, Joanne. But tonight, we're extremely fortunate to continue our relationship with and our partnership with uh, City National Bank. Um, this partnership was launched last year. We have accomplished a lot of things together, but we look forward in supporting each other for years to come. <laughs> He's laughing. And now, please join me in welcoming, well, first of all, thanking City National Bank for hosting this beautiful reception. And, and I wanna welcome their Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President, our good friend James Campanella. Oh, he's behind me. I'm behind you. <laughs> How are you? Here we go. I got one. I'm good. Oh. Magic. I don't want to lose this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good evening. So uh, I first need to start with the uh, an echo. Good. <laughs> with an apology, George Gonzalez was supposed to be here this evening. Um, unfortunately, he was called away on a personal matter they had to deal with. So uh, we. Apologize. The good news is I talk less than he does, so we'll be out here and be able to eat quicker, right? City National Bank is, is a, an important, important part of this community. Um, you know, we've been around since 1946. We started right here in, Bra in Miami-Dade County, just like you guys. Uh, so it's important for us to continue to give back to our community. We actually go and, and we actually participate in 200 different organizations here in Miami-Dade. Uh, just to make sure that we're really giving back to, to, to what we want to do. You know, City National Bank, our new slogan now is say yes to possibilities. You know, we're investing not just here in our state, and not just here in our county, but also in the state. But South Florida, it's always going to be our home. It's always going to be, maybe we, much, there you go. 
I wasn't humming, I promise. <laughs> so we continue to, to develop within the state, but South Florida is always going to be our home, right? This is, this is where we laid our roots. Uh, we're so proud to be part of the Master Brokers, and we really appreciate the partnership that we have with you guys, and we'll continue to have with you. Uh, this is always my favorite event because it's held here, right? So it's, we love to show off what we have and what we've done. Um, so it's important to do that. We're going to have great, exciting uh, commentary from John Paradisi. I mean, everyone loves John, so, you know, you know, we'll have some jokes from him. And Anna is just amazing and, and has more data than anybody I know. Uh, but my other favorite part is getting to introduce my brother, Rich Campanella, who's going to come up here and talk a little, just very briefly about product. Just we'll get that done and out of the way so we can really talk about what's really happening in the market. It's been a lot of changes over the last year. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we want to get and dig into the data, and I won't steal any of John's slides. Uh, he'll, he'll get mad at me. So, Rich, would you want to come up and, and talk a little bit about the products? But thank you very much. If you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free. We have plenty of people around, and uh, thank you for coming, Eliana. Thank you. So can you tell which brother is in management and which brother has to actually earn a living here, right? <laughs> Uh, thank you guys all for coming. Um, I'm going to tell you a little about myself and how I came to City National. So I started out, I started out, uh, some of you guys may know, uh, Coral Gables Federal 34 years ago when Coral Gables Federal was around. They were a small SNL that really cared about the community and they were very in touch with what goes on. They cared, they, they wanted to make deals work. It was, it was something I, I really missed. We, we, I went from them to First Union, Wachovia, Wells Fargo, and uh, about three or four years ago, my wife came to me and said, you're just so unhappy with, I mean, you get to, you work with those big banks and they're such, they don't care about you anymore. It, it gets to the point where I'm dealing with realtors that I built relationships with and I am constantly saying no to them. And it's not, it, it was not a fun, it got to a point where it was a job. I wasn't enjoying it at all. So my brother pulled me over and said, listen, why don't you give us a try? I knew George from First Union Days a long time ago. And uh, this place is just amazing. We have, they really want to work with you. We're a community bank. We are looking for clients. We're not just looking for the transaction. We're looking for a relationship. And what they always go with is we're big enough. We're a $26 billion bank. We're a big bank. But we think small. We try to really reach out to our customers and our realtors and really provide service for what you need out there. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple of our products and, and just kind of show you what we do. Um, first, before I do anything, I want to introduce my teams back there, the, the brains of the operation, Val and Tessa, decided to come and see if I actually do these talks or I'm just out having lunch here and there. Um, they are, if you ever deal with me, those are the people you are really working with. They are incredible. They grab, they, they grab loans, they make them work. They will put whatever, whatever needs to be done, they're on top of those customers 24 seven. That's what we need to do these days. These customers are, it's, markets change very, very quickly. We've gotten to the point where we really need to uh, these customers will change their mind in a heartbeat. So it's hard to, you got to stay on top of them. So I'm going to start out with um, some of our, just to some of our loans, and I'm going to skip around a little bit up there. Um, I'm going to start with conventional or FHA VA. We have some of the best rates in town for our conventional FHA and VA, but what we really have is there are no overlays on any of our products. So our product is I get my DU, Whatever's shown on that DU, that's all I go after. That's all we get. It's a great, I mean, again, I hate to go back to Wells, but Wells, we get our DU, and there'll be 25 other overlays that Wells has on it. We don't do that. We sell them to Fannie Mae. We get, that's all we ask for. If there's one pay stub, we ask for one pay stub. If there's one tax return, we ask for one tax return. Uh, it makes life a lot easier. It's a lot simpler. When I look at it, I can tell you whether I have a deal or not. Um, our City Smart, and... Uh, Ben, you're in here somewhere. Ben Campanella back there does a lot of our City Smart. Um, our City Smart product is one of a kind. We've got one of the best products in the country. It is, it's only for Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and Orlando. It's a first time home buyer product. Um, I'll start with my rates at 4.5% right now. 
the rate fluctuates a little bit, but the rate is at 4.5%, no mortgage insurance, will give up to $5,000 towards closing costs. They have to take an online class. Um, uh, we work with a lot of the condos. Um, there is an income restriction on it. Income, it's again, it's first time home buyers, it's helping people get in their, in their uh, houses, the condos, whatever. For Dade County, I believe it's 60,000 it starts at. Broward, it's 72. Um, Palm Beach goes a little, a little higher. Uh, if you've got that client, you've got one of your client's kids who's trying to get in, it's a great way to get in front of these clients again and, and help their kids out to find something. Um, we have City Smart, we have City Smart Plus, which is not only first time home buyer. You'll have to, you, you can be, it has to be your primary residence, but you don't have to be a first time home buyer, you just can't own another house at closing. Um, that income goes a little higher, goes up to 100 and I think 3,000 in Dade, 123 in Broward. Um, the rate is a little higher, 5.875, but, yep. Is that minimum or maximum? Maximum income. Okay. Maximum income. Uh, we work with a lot of the condos. We're not as strict. It's a portfolio product. We're not as strict as on uh, reserves, which I, a lot of you guys run into and call me about all the time. Um, it's a great product. Uh, again, they take a class. With the City Smart Plus, it has to be a low to moderate area. Call me, I'll give you the actual, there's tons of them around here. You would not believe some of the areas. I do million dollar houses in these areas. Um, call me and I'll give you the actual link you can look in. If you got one of those first time clients, I know you've sent me a couple that, uh, a, couple, a, couple, uh, a couple of friends, kids uh, to help them out. It's a great way to help these college kids out get in because it's tough right now. Um, our jumbo product, we are known for our jumbo products. We have, um, the box is here, we can go out here. We are a relationship bank. We don't just, and again, this is why I moved here. We don't just look at what's on paper. We actually look at everything, not just their W-2s. We look at what they have in, inc what they have in uh, assets. We look in, we'll look at everything about them. We look, we're looking to build a relationship with these customers. We're looking up to accounts. We will, uh, businesses, anything coming in, let us talk to them about it. We do all kinds of things. Frank's in here somewhere. Uh, we have our medical group that just does with our, with, with helps these doctors out. It's a great program. Our jumbo stuff will do stuff. We've done stuff as big as, I've done stuff as big as 25, 30. I know there was a $50 million loan they did not too long ago. They, they're not afraid of the big loans. They, they love to do that stuff. Um, back to Frank and our doctor loans. Doctor, dentist, uh, veterinarian. We have one of the strongest programs out there. We have up to 100% financing, up to a million. A uh, million and a half will go to 95, two million will go up to 89.9%. No mortgage insurance, only two months reserves for these doctors. They only have to have two months of reserves for it. It's a great program, especially for these doctors coming out of school, they don't have a lot of cash. It's one of the best programs out there. Um, and if they come out of school and their loans are deferred, all these guys come out with huge student loans, if their loans are deferred for over one year, we don't count them against them. So it's a great product for these guys getting started. We want those kinds where we'll build those relationships. Frank's team will actually help them with everything, their commercial, their financing. I got one person who couldn't qualify because they, they needed to finance equipment. He's helped them finance equipment, helped them start their first off. It's a great opportunity. And once you get in with a couple doctors, it just, they don't have a lot of time so once they hook into one person, they trust you, all of a sudden you start getting a ton of referrals. Um, our professional program. We have a professional program, our attorney, and our CPA program. We'll do up to 97% financing, up to 850, 95% uh, up to I think a million, and it goes up from there uh, all the way up to two million. Um, no mortgage insurance. Uh, very flexible on um, some of the guidelines with it. Again, with the reserves, very flexible with all that. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get into a lot of these uh, CPA customers. Uh, one of some of my best clients are CPAs. Uh, they'll refer me everybody. Once you get in with one of them, you get into the firm, they'll refer around and you get referrals from them. Construction loans, we do one-time close construction loans. Uh, great product. We'll do a, it's the lock them in a time of, if they use the first year, two years to build, it's interest only for the first two years, then it becomes a 28 year amortization after that. So there's only one set of closing costs. Lot loans, we'll do up to 50% lot loans. 
Uh, residential lot loans, interest only, it's a two-year balloon. It's a, another great product to help a person. They don't have their plans. A lot of them, they buy the lot. They don't have their plans ready. It takes forever to get the plans to Miami. I just, I've got one going in Miami Beach. It's almost uh, nine months. They still don't have their permits. So he bought the lot. We're just sitting. He's got interest only payments for it. Uh, we're doing a lot of bridge loans lately. Uh, the market slowed. I've got all these guys who bought new condos, who bought new construction, and all of a sudden they thought they were gonna sell their house and it hasn't sold as quickly as they thought. So we will do a bridge loan up to 80% of the value of the house. We want the house to be listed. We want you guys selling it as quick as possible. We'll do a two-year balloon interest-only loan for them. It's a great product. We qualify them only on the house they're in. They have to qualify. I got a lot of guys coming to me, oh, I don't wanna, they have to show their income. They qualify with us, we give them their money, they go purchase the house, they list, I just closed one um, just a little while ago, they just sold the house uh, after nine months, they thought they were gonna sell it really, really quickly. Some of these things are sitting a little longer, it's a great opportunity. The builders aren't gonna give them back their deposits, so it's a great opportunity for these guys. Um, foreign national loans. We've got an excellent program for foreign national loans. Call me from what country they're coming from. We'll do 30% down. Uh, we'll do CPA letters who want to see their assets, but it's a very simple process that we go through. That's for most foreign nationals. If they're Canadian or from the UK, we treat them as domestic here. We give them the same guidelines as domestic. It's a great product. We have a lot of, a ton of Canadians all of a sudden. I've got a ton of Canadians. They've had two years of not be able to do anything. They're coming out of the woodworks now. So if you've got a Canadian loan, run it by us. We've got excellent rates for them, and the product is, is second to none. Uh, my last loan is, first of all, we lend in all 50 states, so if you got somebody moving, we can help them. Um, we have a liquidity loan, which I love, and this is one of the big reasons I came to this company. We've got a loan where if you've got a lot of wealthy client, I've got a ton of wealthy clients, either inherited money, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> um, he's excited about the loan, <laughs> um, uh, sold a company. Um, a lot of guys moving from California, sold their company, they've got a lot of cash, their returns don't show the business anymore, they don't have the income coming in. We can do, if they have two times the assets for the loan in the bank, we can do that loan. So we basically take, if they say they've got $5 million in the bank, uh, they want to do a $2 million loan, we'll, take, we'll give the money a haircut. If it's stocks, we give them 70% loan to value based on it. We back out their debt. If they have two times that pro in the loan, we can do that loan. We don't care what the ratios are. We don't look at ratios. We just look that they have the cash. It's a great product if you've got that high-end customer or that customer who just has 25 companies, has a lot of money, and doesn't want to provide all that. We can do that with this loan. We ask for four months bank statements. We just have to see where the money's at. Um, and if they put down 60%, we only need one times the loan. So 40% loan to value, we'll do one times the loan. So just keep that in mind for your and clients who are downsizing, they have a lot of money coming in for sale of their house, we can get them qualified that way. We also, on top of everything else, we wholesale through uh, almost 20 lenders. We have different wholesale products. I have DSCR, I have bank statement loans, I have everything. We're kind of a hybrid between the broker and the big banks. We've got better rates than the brokers do. I've got access to the same thing and I give 10 times the service that any kind of big bank will do. That's the way we are. We have, I'm available to you guys 24 seven. You guys can call me anytime. If I, you, I don't answer you, text me and I'll be back to you very, very quickly. Um, that's all I have. Anything else I can answer for you guys? Thank you so much. I'm gonna toast it off with uh, Andre. Thank you very much, Rich. I gotta say that um, thank you again to City National Bank, and thank you for also always being there at our board meetings. You're always very supportive, always here to help. And there are so many amazing programs from City National. I almost wanna get an Excel sheet and put like all the programs you guys have and then start listing people who would fit those programs and then go after them to offer them opportunities, which will be great because there are so many awesome programs. I would love that. So thank you again. Hello, our fellow master brokers and our amazing host, again, City National Bank. So to shed some uh, bright light on what we are seeing every day in the world and real estate finance, we're delighted to bring back two of our absolute favorite panelists from recent years, Anna Bozovich, 
is the founder and owner of Analytics Miami for the past eight years. She has been publishing long-term trends analysis of the South Florida real estate market. She is serving her fourth term as the governor of the Miami Association of Realtors, and she's often quoted in, by international and national press on topics pertaining to our real estate market. Her real estate reports are outcome agnostic and are published with the intent of bringing truth and clarity to the market. They are entirely data-driven and strive to place local market action within the context of macro trends. In her reports, Anna charts the whole market cycle and emphasizes supply and demand fundamentals across market segments. Anna studied math and physics at Columbia University, and her reports draw upon her abilities to see past the noise and recognize patterns in data. And on top of all of that, she's also a jiu-jitsu MMA fighter. What? She didn't have that on her resume, but I know that fun fact, so I'm throwing that in there. So welcome back, Anna. I'm not sure what kind of martial arts skills John has. Do you have No? Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's also welcome John Paradisi, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at City National Bank. John joined City National three and a half years ago from CIT Bank in New York, where he most recently served as the Managing Director, Chief Strategy Growth Officer from 2016 to 19. While at CIT, John also oversaw for a seven-year period there are 22 billion consumer finance business, which includes residential mortgages and student loans. Biden paid most of those off, so we don't have to worry about those. That's awesome. Oh, there, oh, there you go. At City National, John oversees the strategic direction of the bank, its analytics, marketing, digital transformation, and new products partnerships, as well as BCI Capital, their specialty lending national business. John also serves on the board of directors of the Junior Achievement of Greater Miami and works on um, the financial capability of in the careers of kids that are at risk in our communities. And I just invited John over to visit our Overtown Youth Center project, which I'm on the board of, which is 10 blocks behind the Adrian Arts Center of the Performing Arts. And I'm sure we could have a lot of collaboration between the two of us, which is going to be awesome. So another master Broker, welcome for John Paradisi. So before we launch into questions from our panelists, um, they are going to give us a brief overview of what they are seeing. Anna from a market-specific perspective, and John will show us a more broad economic trend to consider. And Anna will start us off. Thank you very much. Yeah, as, as um, and doing this every year is is really extra wonderful because we are in essence documenting this for what is in our for our purposes once in a lifetime shift in economic focus in our nation and the story is going to keep writing itself and as realtors we really are the the mascots of the region. It behooves us to be able to educate our clients as to why or how the reality here may be different from what they're hearing in the mainstream news. I know in the room here we have some of the top brokers and realtors in South Florida, so it's extra important that we all fully understand why the national news is, well, getting it wrong in many cases and why long Miami is very, very real. So we're going to quickly cover three points. What's driving it? Is it real? And how long will it last? Which one do I press? Okay. And my aside here, this is recent press. So we're, we're living rent-free in their heads. Um, there's a whole slew of anecdotal articles coming out right now with very little actual data in them that are sort of trying to cast dispersions upon our, our region's growth. And the publications are largely you know, New York-based organizations. And remember, haters are fans too, and we're taking their taxpayers. So this is perhaps motivating these headlines. We have the Wall Street Journal saying Miami's office market was red hot, now its tallest planned tower can't fill its space. Well, the Wall Street Journal also had this egregiously kind of misrepresentative headline last year implying that we lost more population than Newark during COVID. I actually had written a whole post on this, and they were wrong. They, they took Brookings Institute data and 
misconstrued it. So here we go again. But they're neglecting to mention that our office vacancy is far, far lower than that of New York City, and that we have excellent news. We have we have 830 Brickle about to get its, its TCO, and it, it has it's 100% leased at prices that would have been records before to Citadel, to Microsoft, and so forth. We have, um, I think I saw it today in the news, 2600 Biscayne is 50% leased before they even broke ground. We, we have great news in our office space, and yet they have this article, and don't mention that you know New York had 19.2% vacancy while we're under 10%. Next. Yeah, there you go. There are lots of good stories with actual data that could be done, and they're choosing not to. Second, we have the real deal saying, how long can hashtag long Miami last? They even had a video with someone basically making fun of it, saying, oh, they keep saying long Miami. Well, people keep leaving New York. That's how, that's how long it will last. And then we even have Yahoo Finance. They had this article entitled Paradise Lost. The heading picture actually showed the Miami skyline, but the article itself only mentioned Florida and not Miami. And it's kind of funny because our, both our condos and our single family homes hit record high median pricing in the months of March while inventory is significantly below pre-COVID. So what, what do they mean paradise lost? Our markets are, are very tight. It's, it's the opposite of that. But I expect to see more of this because the, the, the change that's happening in our, in our country is um, unsettling to people. It's a lot of identity politics. People are resistant to change. So I expect to see more of these types of headlines coming out. So get ready to be able to counter them to, to, with, with your clients. Next. Um, so again, this is updated from 2023. We have data from the IRS showing that once again, the states in blue had the highest percentage population gains. So when it comes to raw population, Texas and Florida are still leading the way. Um, and of course, this coincides, here's a little map. This is from 2022, but it's the same pattern. I just wanted to juxtapose that, put it next to the map showing top tax rates. And the pattern is very, very clear. People are leaving high tax states. And I don't see this changing because COVID broke habits. People no longer went to work how they used to and a certain percentage realized that they don't have to ever again. And these people are moving and creating new habits. How we used to live and work, these were 20th century creations before internet habits. All the office buildings, all of that was built before the internet. And this, this migration is fueled by a lot of things and I don't see it going backwards. There's not gonna be some atavistic reversion back to the 20th century. It always moves forwards. And then second of all, what people are failing to appreciate is that momentum is very, very real and it, it, it builds. Taxpayers, in, in high tax jurisdictions like New York and California, your top 1% of taxpayers account for over 40% to be conservative, really 45% of revenue. And those people leave, it's gonna balloon their budget gaps and they're gonna keep enacting more policies that are hostile towards capital, thus kicking out more capital. So this will likely only accelerate over the next five to 10 years as their state finances hurt. Sorry? No. Although I happen to, I, I have a good friend who was tax treated there, and I spoke to him the other day, and he feels that people are leaving Puerto Rico because their new government is against the tax treaty stuff, and he expects an outflow from Puerto Rico on that topic. Um, just a, there are lots of these, but just to keep this short, um, there's a huge, a, a huge migration of AUM, of assets under management, a trillion dollars left. Um, New York between Q1 of 2020 and Q1 2023. Florida was the largest recipient, and now for the first time, Florida has more AUM than Connecticut. Next, all right, Long Miami, is it real? How do we see it in our market? These are charts that I've been doing for a while that I really, really love. When you isolate for price per square foot, you really see the effects of the incoming wealth and talent migration. High prices per square foot tend to isolate for a new product at prime location. And this is where we see the post-COVID reality blowing the pre-COVID reality out of the water. This is, uh, is Tri-County, so aggregate Broward, Miami-Dade, and Palm Beach. Um, and, and look at the all cash percentage, it's right at the crease there, but it's over 87% for over 2,000 a square foot uh, for single family homes and 92% for condos past 2,000 a square foot. Um, keep it moving here, uh, Miami-Dade, same pattern. So Miami-Dade and Palm Beach is even a bit more, more all cash than we are, but it's the same pattern. And this very much, I mean, when, when, you see, when you see a spike in data like this, you have to ask what happened, what changed? And, and, and th this right here illustrates the appetites, as I call it, of the wealth and talent migration. Um, this is just an annual data showing our ramp up of median pricing while we have a concurrent decrease in, in inventory. Oops, yes, yeah, same pattern holds for condos. And then uh, da, 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 our tale of two markets. So the press likes to report on the market as a whole. It's a simplistic thing to do and it's easy. 
the market as a whole is, has had substantial drops in transaction volume. But as you can see here, the drops in transaction volume occur at lower price points, which is where obviously the plurality of transactions exist. So if we look at quarterly data showing here transaction volume below $500,000, this is for single family homes, we have a massive drop of 77%. It's just, it's plummeting. But why is it plummeting? Because inventory has dropped even more. Inventory is down 84% below half a million dollars for single family homes. It's basically disappearing. And this is also, by the way, uh, an indication that the floor of our market is rising. So, thank you. Yeah, it's shocking. I, I've, I've like triple checked this because every time I look at it, I'm like, wow, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's gone away. So well, again, when we say the whole, and, and obviously the median price point, median for, for single family is 650 right now as of March. Um, so that's basically you know, half the market by definition is below 650. And that's where we've had this huge loss of transaction of, of inventory and then a huge drop in transaction volume. Same pattern holds for condos. A little bit less dramatic, but 57% drop below 500,000. By the median condo prices is lower. It's uh, condos. It's like a 420. So if we look at condos below 400, it's even it's even worse. And then to juxtapose this, let's go. All right. This is five million and plus sales. Since this is um, a room of brokers who cater to the luxury sector. We're actually up over year. Each bar represents transaction volume for the month of January plus February. So again, while we have these steep, steep declines at price points at the median and below, at the luxury end, we're still far higher than we were pre-COVID and actually we're up year over year. Same pattern, okay. Um, and this is uh, going by that price per square foot metric. For 1,000 and up per square foot, single family homes actually had a record January plus February, higher than 2022. And then con condos were not at the highs of 2022, but they're higher than they were last year. So again, wealth and talent migration in action. And actually I have a theory for the single family home ones. We, we can't add more single family home inventory vertically. So I expect this slight divergence, we'll call it, to, to continue because we can add more condos. We can add multifamily, which takes pressure off of condos, all those things. We can't add single family. So a single family within proximity of the urban core, that's a scarce resource, especially if it's a waterfront, especially if it's close to downtown schools, whatever, all this stuff. We can't build more of it. So I expect to see single family just continue to slightly outperform the, the condo space. And then next, all right, why is this going to continue? So I said population, that po population migration is one of those like tertiary causes. It's not, it's what, it's what we can observe. But this is a Venn diagram I've been putting up for a while because this, this really is what's going on and why I've been saying for years that this will not turn around. Nothing lasts forever. Change is, our, is inevitable. It, it is the constant. And people have trouble with this, which is, again, why we're seeing negative headlines and all sorts of press. New York was the capital of the 20th century world. Before that, it was London. Before that, it was Amsterdam. Nothing is forever. There will always be a next shift. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not here. I don't think I'm wrong. But besides, besides that, there, there will be a shift. That is guaranteed. We've had the internet come in. So one of these three, three things can happen to accelerate shifts or changes in the world around you. One of them is what I call empire cycles. This is when countries have you know, issues with their monetary, monetary policy, polarization, wealth polarization, all those things, and we have that. All you have to do is look at electoral maps and how the country has voted since Reagan. You're gonna see polarization of belief systems, wealth gaps, all that stuff. That leads to instability within the country, and now we have people relocating based upon their belief systems also. So that's happening, and that's not gonna go away. It's gonna accelerate. We see the insanity with politics. That's gonna go on for at least 10 years. Then we have tech adoption. It's like when the Gutenberg printing press came to Europe. The internet changed how we work. That's a force now too. Even if, even if 10% of people change their behaviors at scale, it's enormous. Then we have war slash pandemic and that broke habits. So we're in the middle of the Venn diagram. So this shift isn't gonna go anywhere. I think it's still early days. And then an example, you know, we, we have Bezos, we have all these guys. Bezos is an example of a symbolic vanguard and also a, sy a symbol or an example of the stupidity of local politicians and governments. All politicians wanna do is get reelected, that's it. That's why they're gonna keep creating policies that are hostile to wealth when it's obvious that, that these policies will just lead to more wealth migration. Why are they doing it? They're doing it to get reelected. They're not aligned with the success of their jurisdictions. So for example, when Bezos left the state of Washington, his, his departure took away over 45% of revenue from some unrealized capital gains tax they've been floating around. One guy took away 45% of it. He's like, sorry, I'm out. 
And now we have Los Angeles recently proposed that new law where owners have to pay relocation costs of tenants, meanwhile they're hemorrhaging population. Why? Because those politicians want to get reelected and they will increasingly pander to the percentage that does not pay it. And this will keep fueling those cycles. And hopefully we'll continue to be on the receiving end because I'm an optimist, let's go back here, the human condition keeps improving, innovation, the human spirit, it always flows somewhere and it'll flow towards the path of least resistance where it can flourish. And I think that we're all very fortunate to be here in South Florida. You know, we had, um, I think it was last year, we had the highest per capita new business filings of any city with population over half a million in America. We have the highest percentage of high earning millennials moving here. This is still very, very much early days and we all need to be well versed on this so we can counter these negative, jealous headlines. All right, so I learned a few things out of that. One, don't let Anna go first. So it's no more of that. I mean, I'm, I'm in my home field here and I'm going last. Two, uh, don't train with Anna because I'm gonna end up in a headlock and so I don't want that. She invited me to train, I said, okay. Then I find out she's a jujitsu pro, I'm not doing it. And three, I'm not gonna be able to afford anything under $1,000 a foot anywhere where I want to live. So really tons of good news to kick off the uh, seven o'clock hour. But all right. So uh, mine's going to be shorter, okay? Um, but fun packed. Disclosure, don't read this or you may die. The next one, can I make a residential outlook? Okay. All right. So broad economic view, um, May 2020, we had 13% unemployment. Um, you know, that's when COVID kind of got going. And then in June, we're at 5.9%. So things started to look up a little bit. In January, we finally got back to 3.7%. So that's great news. And then you take the micro picture into Florida. We're at 3.1, so we're beating the rest of the country. And then in Miami-Dade, we're, you know, fat and happy at 1.6%. So everyone's employed. Everyone's making money. Everyone can buy homes. So you guys should be pretty happy. Uh, with that. Now, there's no homes, so that's the bad news. But uh, everyone can afford them, apparently. Uh, look, <laughs> but look, the migration that Anna was talking about, we're still seeing those inbounds, right? They're all coming from the states that we all know, low taxes or, you know, um, are, are winning away. And our friends in New York and other places haven't figured out to get out of their way. But the one place where I'll disagree with Anna is that some of these states will figure it out, not California. California will not figure it out because they're not sharp enough to figure it out. But at some point in time, people will realize in New York that things are getting way too expensive and they'll figure it out. They'll kick out, you know, these mayors that are in there making stupid decisions. They'll bring in the economy back. They'll give tax breaks. They'll get people back in there. And they'll figure out how to take the licks on the office space. And New York still has the charm of New York, so people are still going to visit it. I was there two months ago. I could barely walk anywhere near Times Square. Uh, you know, given the density of the population. I was there uh, for the holidays and uh, everybody wanted to go see the tree and I was trying to avoid it desperately because I knew that I was going to encounter four people wide on the sidewalk holding hands while staring at the damn tree and I didn't want to be there, okay? That's what we call, New Yorkers call classic people walking around not knowing where they're going and that's what happens in New York. There's a lot of tourists, a lot of people and the economy is going to continue to move. The question is going to be, are they going to get out of their own way? And if, until they do, Florida and states like Texas will continue to benefit and see big influx uh, of people who are tired of paying high taxes. Okay. Uh, politics, that's a favorite topic. Uh, so in the state, in, in the years where typically there's an election uh, happening, very little happens, unfortunately, because everybody's worried about you know, issues and how are they going to come out and how they're going to position themselves. So they're all going to campaign on the same things. They campaign every time and not hold any promises. Uh, they're excellent at that. Uh, and I think we're not going to see a whole lot of change uh, until there's a new president. So people will continue to look for bills, but, you know, Biden's a sitting duck at this point. Nothing's going to happen. And we'll see what November brings. Um, economic recovery and rates. So we saw seven hikes in 2022 for 425 basis points, unprecedented. It's never happened. I showed, I showed a chart last time I was here a year ago that showed the steepness of the increases in the rates. 
it's way steeper than it's ever been over that period of time. There's never been a period like that where rates have gone up that much. Um, and so then we had four in 2023, just to round it out to 525 basis points. And now we have a meeting in March. Nothing's going to happen. Rates won't move. Uh, June's going to come. I put 98% chances rates will not move. And then we're going to go to the second half of the year. And I think um, it, it'll continue to be a bit of a roller coaster between the Treasury rates and the stock market. And we'll see who wins, right? Every day, the, you know, there's good news and there's bad news and there's good news again. And, and you know, and if you own certain stocks, you just see kind of your portfolio is going up and down and then you realize it's best not to look at it. Um, it's like uh, somebody having a heart attack, right? You see it moving around all day long. But I think it'll settle down a little bit. In the second half, I think rates will start to come down. I think um, they'll have to stimulate uh, the economy a little bit more. But I do think you'll start to see rates. My guess is we'll see 75 to 100 basis points between you know June and December at best. Uh, and it'll depend on certain economic factors like core CPI and, and general CPI. And depending on whether or not they can get there, I mean, the Fed, the Fed seems to be uh, resolved to the fact that they want to get inflation down to 2%. Uh, no one's told them that because they only raised rates to 425 and then 525 basis points, that that wasn't enough. What they needed to do was to go to 600. And they didn't want to do that. Why? Because if they went to 600, they would have pushed the economy into a recession. And the Fed doesn't want to be written in the books as the people who push the economy into the recession. They want to be known for the soft landing. The problem with the soft landing is that inflation will continue to persist at between 3 and 4%. So they're kind of stuck, right? They're hoping that you know, maybe they have a lucky roll and, you know, they get to below 3% and they can declare victory. It's going to be hard, okay? So we'll see what breaks there, but um, I think we'll see what happens in the consumer space. We'll see what happens in credit card debt, student lending debt. Those are all-time highs, okay? So people are borrowing more and more and more, and they're borrowing at higher rates, okay? So if you look at your credit card statements, 25 30%, they're, they're high, and, and that... Um, has a toll on things. In the commercial banking space, you know, banks hold about 50% of the CRE debt. Who's got the other 50%? Alternative credit, private equity firms who are taking a lot of leverage, charging very high rates, and some of those rates are going to continue to reset. So we looked at our own portfolio, right, and said, oh my God, should we be worried about, you know, selling our own book, right? What's happening in commercial real estate now? We're heavily concentrated in Florida. It's good news. 83% of our book is in the state. Um, the rest of it is from clients who are from Florida, but we just follow them around the country when they're doing a project. Uh, because again, to what Rich said earlier, I think he's back there, there's Rich, yeah. To the relationship model, right? You wanna do a project in, uh, in New York and you know, we'll look at it, evaluate it for its merit, but if you're a client of the bank, we'll do it. You wanna buy a house in, uh, in Aspen, no problem. Uh, so we'll do all those things. Uh, but when we look at the office space, um, maybe slight variation from what Anna was talking about as well is, yeah, we got some concerns about the office space. I know pe people are leasing things up, but there's class A and there's class B and there's class C and, and so on. And so um, I, I guess it depends, right? It depends on the, on the tenant and depends on the anchor. It depends on when those, uh, what's going to happen to those uh, cap rates uh, when they're coming due. And people are going to see a four to 500 basis point shock to their payment. And when you got a 15, 20 million dollar loan, that's a big awakening coming for some of the folks who are going to be looking at those payments. And, um, you know, rents aren't going up that much. So it's going to squeeze some people. And so we'll see what that means, right? So we have maybe, I don't know, 50 or 60 properties that in the next two years are going to reset. So we're looking at it and we do stress test scenarios, right? We say, hey, what happens to this guy based on what we knew about them then? And then we touch our clients and we understand more about them. We know what's going on with their rentals. That's what it's about. It's about cash flow. And so big, big story is we're not overly concerned about our clients, but I'm fairly certain that you're going to see some people in the market having troubles in the next six to 12 months if rates do not start coming down. If rates don't start coming down soon, you're going to see things resetting between 24 and 25 that will create some havoc, okay? The good news on the residential side is you didn't have that problem. Why? Well, because when people call loans adjustable rate loans, they're not adjustable. You're doing 525, 727, 723s, 10-year IOs, 10-year loan, 10, 10, 10 20s, that's not, that's not an arm. Yeah, it's an arm in five years. The customer's got five years to get out of that thing from the height of the market. They'll find an exit, uh, and by then, they'll have built out more equity. So a little different in the commercial real estate space 
versus that because that stuff on the commercial real estate comes a little sooner. Some of those are two-year, three-year deals. Um, some of them 18, 19 paper. So anyone who was doing big refis in 21 and 22, again, probably okay. By the time that stuff comes to reset on an arm, you're going to be refinancing anyway. So less of an impact, I think, to the residential side. But existing home sales, uh, minus 6.5% year over year. Uh, Case Shiller index pricing, year over year, US plus 5.4, uh, Miami plus 11, uh, which we all know why, um, and housing prices slightly dipped in Q3, Q4. But again, the demand supply here is the issue, right? You guys all know this. Uh, good inventory is hard to come by. And so if you're buying a single family home, to Anna's point, which doesn't really exist in, in the abundance that we need, those are getting priced at 1,100, 1,200 a foot um, in the good neighborhoods, right? Coral Gables. Uh, you know, uh, Pinecrest, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the Grove. If you're in a good area, you're going to get top dollar, and there's still people willing to pay that. Let's see. All right, this is more headlines from the stuff that we're talking about. Unemployment again, 3.1. Florida's economy continues to outpace the country. People moving here. GDP growth now makes us the 14th uh, largest economy in the world. Uh, our parent company is from Chile. We have more people than Chile in the state of Florida. You know, they have 19 million people in, in Chile, and we have 20-something million people in the state of Florida. So Florida is uh, becoming much more uh, prominent um, in, in the global space. And then, which I thought was interesting, uh, Florida emerges as corporate migration. Headquarters influx surges by 86%. And we have now more jobs in New York for the first time. But... Bad news in the bottom is <laughs> Miami also tops the list with the biggest inflation problems. So cost of things are going up. I think everybody's noticing that. I don't care where you live, where you are. You go in the supermarket, you go to a restaurant, you see price increases um, are, are here. Gas. But you know what's funny about gas is if you kind of look at gas prices three years ago, you look at gas prices now, that's probably not where we saw a lot of the increases. It's, a lot of it is on food, you know. I mean, I go to a supermarket. I remember back in 20, 2019, 2020, you know, again, buying apple juice for 275 a gallon, now it's four and a quarter. That's a 50% increase, right? So that's not, if you look at the general CPI, they would say something that was worth $100, you know, three years ago, it's now $109, that's 9%. That's too generic. That's very top line. If you start looking under the covers and you're looking at specific categories, some of the things that impact most of the people every day, you're going to see more like in the tune of 20 to 30% probably on average. I'm not going to bore you a lot of this. You guys will get this presentation anyway. Um, the key residential trends in the market, prices are still high, median sale prices up 47%. Um, you know, th those are just big numbers. Uh, Fed's committed to fighting the inflation like I talked about. Uh, people keep moving to the suburbs, um, you know, looking for lower real estate taxes, uh, although I think they're having a hard time with that. Uh, total cost of ownership becomes a key metric, right? We're going to touch on this in a minute. Purchase prices, mortgage rates, uh, property taxes, HOA fees, uh, maintenance costs, and our favorite insurance premiums, okay? Those are, and I know you guys ran a, did a survey, a lot of that kind of coming here in the, next, uh, in the next piece. Not a lot of great news there, okay? But... Um, look, not a lot here um, that I want to touch on more. Um, you guys will read this. Um, this is just the residentials. In, in, again, here is the shortage. New single and multifamily home production will be below demand. South Florida needs about 200,000 new units a year. But it's only adding 20,000. There's your gap, and that's what keeps, keeps the prices up. You're going to keep seeing cash buyers because rates, are, for now, if they're elevated, they'll consider using cash instead. Uh, but... Let's face it, people are getting pushed out of the state. What's happening is the population is the same, flat, flattish. The problem is it's a different mix, right? You got the people who can't afford it, who took advantage and cashed out, moved somewhere else. And then you got the high-flying people coming in with the dollars, right, coming from the states that we talked about. So it's just changing. The, the mix of people is changing. Uh, and that's driving up costs. That's why everything here costs more because people can charge more. Anyway. Uh, that's it. Why don't we move on to the Great job. next section. Great job. Thank you very much. John, out of curiosity, when you were running your analysis on the commercial sector in your portfolio of clients, what was the average cap rate that those properties were running at? The ones that were coming up for uh, yeah. 
a reset? Uh, I want to say probably in the eight and change rate, something Got like it. that. So if it goes up, you know, 400, 500 bips. Yeah. Well, that's a, no, that's at the reset. That was at, that was based on the where they're going. Because obviously there's a lot of concern. Yeah, I mean, right that. now those average rates in the portfolio in the back book, you're talking, you know, four and a half, five percent probably. Yeah. Right. So those guys who were done in 21, 22, um, when the rates were basically near zero. Right, so you were talking, you know, think about it. It's always typically the, the rates on commercial real estate uh, run somewhere between 250 and 350, depending on the property type. If it's construction, it's more expensive. If it's term, yeah. it's going to be 250, 275. Let's go like into the charts. Let's, let's put up there the diagram and let's go into uh, some of the questions and concerns that we had a survey and some of our master brokers uh, came up with these questions. Thank you. Yeah. So, talking about costs and uh, inflation, you know, one of the biggest concerns here uh, in the Miami real estate market that people have most concern with per our survey is rising insurance costs and expenses relating to condo associations. Now, so many condo associations right now are getting hit extremely hard, especially after the Champagne Towers collapse. And add that together with the insurance costs, it's kind of like a perfect storm of a lot of people who were not expecting to have these costs, especially even people who are buying, who you're approving loans for, and all of a sudden, after the loan is approved, six months into the loan, into the loan, which they just barely got possibly approved, and then they get hit with a hundred thousand dollar special assessment, or a fifty thousand dollar special assessment. Um, you know, what do, what are you seeing in the market? And you're, what, is the bank doing anything? How are you adjusting to these situations? Because obviously, it's a concern for a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no. There's no great answer. I mean, honestly, I think the uh, special, I mean, we, after Surfside, um, you know, our uh, HOA team, so we have a team that focuses on, on HOAs. And HOA has predominantly always been a play on the depository side, right? I mean, mostly just banking these HOAs and holding their cash and, and paying them a rate for it that then kind of trickles down, down the line. But then when Surfside happened, we knew that was going to change the market. And so we created a lending program um, for the HOAs to be able to give flexibility because we can run, you know, 20 year, even longer, perhaps amortization on those, on those assessments that you're talking about. Which, let me stop you for a second. So for all of you that are, are selling these condos and you're running into a situation where these special assessments are coming in, reach out to City National because they're one of the few people that will go in and finance these special assessments. And then also they'll be able to finance people who are buying in the building since they're already controlling the special assessment uh, loan, correct? No, that's right. So we'll go in. We'll we'll work with the typically with the with the board and 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 uh, the uh, age, you know the property managers uh, to basically look at the need, look at what they're doing, um, and then assess you know what's necessary, right? And so they'll they'll typically what we're seeing is the lead times are are still uh, challenging, but we see before they had a, a beginning they had an, an issue with engineers. They couldn't find enough engineers to kind of scope out these properties and understand, especially for the ones that were over 30 years, uh, that really required it based on the change in legislation. They, um, they couldn't get enough engineers on site to review these properties. And, and I think that's gotten a little bit better because now they've kind of opened it up to other professionals who can, who can review this. Before it was only certain folks that can look at these properties. I think they've uh, extended uh, the amount of qualified people that can look at the properties and assess you know, what's needed. Um, and, but then again, yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. We do that, and then we do the financing on the condos um, if that's necessary. So um, let's go over to the next slide, please. Uh, switching over to something more optimistic. You know, we're hearing great stuff. Anna, you gave us some great tips, and there are great uh, Instagrammable slides to put in show to our clients, right? So um, which opportunity in Miami real estate market has you most optimistic? This is our results here from our... Master Brokers, the continued pipeline of high net worth individuals moving here, which Anna showed those stats, which were amazing, uh, showing our awesome numbers in 21, 22, 23. Next slide. How much do you think the 2024 presidential election will impact the Miami real estate market? All of you could see that. Significant impact, some impact. We shall see. Any thoughts on this? I don't know. I, I, I don't see a high correlation there. I just because I think All good. a lot's going to happen. Let's go into the real question that we have here for insurance. What new parameters, which you answered a little bit about this, what new parameters will the bank adopt if condominium associations decide to not buy windstorm insurance? 
What happened? Slide? No, we don't have a slide. This is a, a question regarding insurance to John and Anna. Sorry. What new parameters slide will... Slide and there was no slide. No. What new parameters will bank with the bank adopt if condominium associations decided not to buy wind insurance? <laughs> it's like deciding not to put gas in your car if you want to go somewhere. Um, I mean, look, I, you, you need wind. <laughs> the bank's going to make a loan, right, on, on a property. And um, we have to secure the interest in that. And especially when you're kind of leveraging at, say, 60% or something like that, 65%, uh, that's, that's a, lot of, um, a lot of debt for us to put on the line. So uh, what have we done in, with, some I mean, with some clients? What you could do is, uh, depending on their holdings with the bank, you can secure it in different ways. So if the client wants to take the risk and they want to secure it with cash or they want to create a much lower loan of value, we, we've looked at structures like that, but Listen, it's the, not the, a... The risk is high. Uh, according, to very core, high. according to CoreLogic, uh, they project Miami-Dade County will experience an average of a billion dollars in annual property loss, a loss yeah. uh, per year by 2050. Right. And the next county would be Jefferson Parish in Louisiana expecting okay. 500 million. Yeah. So it's a big number. Our, our average year in premiums have reached $6,000 um, Three times as much as the national average of 1,700. Yeah, look, the banks can't can't fix the problem. I, I think the banks can look for creative solutions with each customer on an individual basis to see what makes sense, uh, based on their risk appetite and, and based on what they can do with us to secure that interest. But you know, we're not in the business of charging, say, seven, eight percent on, on a loan and taking a risk on 50 million dollars. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. So, we're in the business of facilitating structures and transactions for our best clients. Uh, and for all clients, but the best clients are the, usually the ones that have a lot of wherewithal to be able to do other things to basically save on things like wind, right? Yeah. Uh, but that means they have to put some skin in the game and they have to create some protection. And when you do that, in certain situations, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not plain vanilla, yes or no, or what can you do? It's situation by situation. We work with the client and we find a solution that, that can work. So, Anna, you touched on Ken Griffin, Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. FinTech migration in general. Um, so how do we align ourselves with this wealth and talent migration? No pun intended, but can we bank on the migration uh, continuing in the foreseeable future? And I, I think you, you hit a lot of those. Can you elaborate a little bit more on them? Yeah, how can we align with it? That's something I've been, I've, I've been saying for a while because it is a tale of two markets. And I think that older inventory is going to keep underperforming. For example, I've charted performance of stuff by decade built, all those things. And it's a tale of two markets in terms of price point and also in terms of age built. Um, and so I would say as real estate professionals, it just, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that the high end, I think, will continue benefiting from this wealth and talent migration. The national narrative or what's the news may not reflect that reality, but just sort of how do you align with it? Recognize domestically where this buyer is coming from, it's pretty clear, and then recognize what their appetites are for. And I, I think it's also pretty clear. It's, it's um, high price per square foot, new product, which is what, when you isolate from price per square foot, you're isolating for a prime location, new product. And those segments are outperforming pre-COVID realities by orders of magnitude. And as real estate professionals who want to make money, we want to align with the segments of the market that are growing. Anna, you want to hit on the next question of interest rates. Where do you, if you were going to be predicting, where do you see interest rates in the next year not, or two? Not much lower. Not much lower. John? Yeah, look, I think second, nothing in the first half of the year, like I said, second half, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 basis points max, depending on, again, what the Fed is seeing uh, from the economy. And, and that today, it, it can go in many different directions. I don't think they're going to go higher. Yeah. But, I, but I think slow will, will be down, it'll come down slowly. It's Listen, not going to come down 500 basis points. Yeah, I'm sure it's not. Yeah. Listen, we have amazing talent of, of brokers here. We have about another five minutes before we eat. I'm sure we're all hungry. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have an awesome question. We have them two here. Uh, let's try to get some questions here from the audience. So it's kind of a two-part, a comment and a question. Uh, this morning I saw an amazing statistic from the U.S. Census Bureau. They, they interviewed every top city in America to find out how many people in each city were self-employed. Four of the top ten are in Florida, three are in California, two in Texas. Amazed me to find out that the number one city with the most number of self-employed people is Hialeah. <laughs> number two, number two is Miami, of course, and the two others in uh, Florida include Cape Coral. 
the question became up because <laughs> many banks are now providing loans that are not based on personal income, that are not based on IRS statistics, not based on your tax returns. They're based on, and I'm going to get the acronym wrong, DCRS or something like that, about debt That's ratio right. to the investment property. Does City National have a program like that? And have you heard about it or seen anything about that? Yeah, Rich. Now, now you know who to call. And another, another fun fact about Hialeah is that they probably have the highest number of Airbnbs and homes in the city of Hialeah. It's true because most people want to go there and spend a lot of time with their families and they're not going to go to hotels. The, exactly. So I'm sure that you're going to find some good deals on Hialeah there to uh, apply I mean, that, some that CRA ratio. Loans. <laughs> exactly. I also did some CRA Add loans. that to that Excel sheet there, Chris. So raise your hand. I'm sure that there's some questions in here. You got a question? There you go, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for today. Uh, quick question. How does climate change uh, factor into your numbers now and looking into the future? Yeah, I get that question a lot from the board. What are we doing about sea level rise? I'm like, <laughs> It's going to build taller, you know? I mean, I, I, I think... Build taller. Yeah, just, just, you know, just, have, a, just have a higher starting point. I, 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 just, I don't want to interrupt you, but I was driving around a, a, yeah. a whole bunch of different houses on, on Palm Island, and all the new construction, the first floor of every house is the roof of the house next door. Yes. I mean, literally, it's, it's right over the roof of the house next door. Yep. Yep. I don't know. Look, there's, there's, um, we, we do a lot on the ESG side. Uh, you know, where we, we look to finance uh, wind farms, uh, solar power. So, yeah, we do it. We do it. We have a national, you know, business that, that you know, did a lot of that, that work. We probably lent about $300 million. We financed a, a ship off the coast of uh, Martha's Vineyard to go and, and repair solar panels. Like we, so we've done a lot of that type of stuff to, to busy contribute to trying to, to, to make, uh, you know, maybe the world slightly a better place. Uh, as far as it comes to Miami, uh, again, we, we love to do green stuff. So when we're, we, we can finance commercial real estate on, on the green side and we have uh, some, some breaks that we can give people when, when they're financing really green properties. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, we're hoping that, uh, that the building codes continue to keep up pace with uh, where things are headed and do exactly what you guys just talked about, which is start. And a, and a lot of higher. cities are building on the infrastructure to make sure they raise roads and they add the proper... Um, you know, and plumbing and supplies. Yeah, and, and hopefully we're not going to be Italy for four months. And I would also suggest long, that, um, given you guys what business you're in, that people start buying second homes where there's no water. You know, just go mm. go in more. You know, um, it's not another country. And it's just going to make <laughs> waterfront a little at some point a little yeah, deeper. Oklahoma will have waterfront. Right. Two questions, but the one that I remember right now: Do you do any financing for the city for the government to do? Uh, any infrastructure that they're working on, for example, the water accumulation in the uh, Edgewater area off of Biscayne, yeah. all of that? We've done some stuff in the past. I don't know right now what's, what's in the pipeline, but we've done some things around the city for sure in the past. There are, um, there are institutions that really work on those bonds for the city. Yeah, right? I just don't know if, that, if there's anything in, in the works currently. A uh, couple more questions. Way. Raise your hand. Let's go. I had another question uh, relating to climate change, and that is there's a catch-22 here. In Florida, it's not just the rising water, it's the lack of drinking water that we're going to have if we have too many people moving here. So your thing of showing needing 200,000 new homes is really not practical and will hurt us rather than help us. And what's happening now that I see the developers couldn't care less about our situation. They're in here, they're building as much as possible, and then they're out of here. They don't care. So how does, how are the lenders, how are the developers, how are you estimating what is going to happen when we run out of water? We can't go into the Everglades or we'll make things even worse. So I'm an optimist on these things. Um, Singapore imports its water. Las Vegas imports its water. I'm not saying we have to import water, but I don't think that we're not going to have water. I, I think there will be some, some solution that will work itself out as smart people continue to move here. Um, I don't have the answer today, but we're not in a dire situation today either. So I'm, I'm generally optimistic about such things. And i got to say that developers are not going to build if people are not buying. So the developers are building because people are buying. Oh, before we get back to you, question, anyone? 
Anyone? Sure? All right, last one then. Here we go. Well, this is, I wonder, because they can do uh, 1428 Brickle, which I think um, already put, uh, they're working in that direction, so they put solar panels, they put a whole backbone of solar panel in their building. So what about reverse osmosis perhaps? It'll come, who knows? We have all this ocean water, I don't know. So, some solution will, will present itself over time. I, I'm an optimist. Alicia, 1428 just got a great plug right? here. <laughs> Good job. Five bucks to her, please. Jason, we, are you sure? Can we, are you, he's the boss, so we gotta give him the mic. I have to ask this. I just, Anna gave an, an incredible explanation on her Instagram, which I highly recommend you follow if you don't already about the difference between migration to Florida versus Texas. We are often oh, compared to yeah. Texas in terms of people from, uh, from around right, the country right. migrating. And the different, right. while the numbers might be bigger, uh, they're, they're we're kind, kind of, of right there, one and two, the, the net numbers. But they, the, the IRS really partitioned, back in 2021, they really partitioned um, data based on income brackets of where people were moving. And it showed that we were receiving four times as many high-value taxpayers. So their they're, they're cut off as people who are filing over $200,000 a year. We were receiving four times as many as Texas. And, and so the, the population is, is not equivalent. They also had some data back then showing that the median uh, reported income of somebody relocating to South Florida from Manhattan was like 1.2 million, and from New York City it was like 600,000 and something like this. So we're getting the high value earners. And people from, I grew up in New York City, I've been here for 11 years, but I grew up in New York City, and New Yorkers are not moving to Texas. Like, it's, they're just not. I'm not, I don't want to be mean about uh, Texas. That's true. But, Listen, that's true. <laughs> The energy in Miami right now is just across the world. There's no one that does not want to have a piece of Miami. And we're the ones that are lucky enough to get to sell the dream. We get to sell where we live. We get to sell what we love. So we're going to continue to do that and continue to make money while we make other people happy to live where we've been living for such a long time. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much to City National Bank once again. And enjoy a beautiful dinner. Thank you.